Hey everyone, in my earlier videos I pointed out how Luke's got an eye for detail in the book of Acts, showing that he's a reliable writer. Now, let's dive into his gospel. It's not just a copy-paste job of Mark's work, Luke's got his own unique details that we can verify with sources outside of the Bible. So for starters, Luke shares a cool detail about the tax collector Zacchaeus climbing a sycamore tree in Jericho. New Testament scholar Peter J. Williams notes that the tree, Ficus sycamorus, wasn't found in northern Mediterranean areas like Italy, Greece, or Turkey, and doesn't have natural pollinators in those places. But the tree was known to be a characteristic site in Jericho, as 2nd century rabbi Abba Shaul noted in the Talmud. So how did Luke know there were sycamores in Jericho? The easiest explanation is that he either had been there himself, or chatted with somebody who had. Now, you might be thinking, so what? Luke knows about some trees, big deal. But remember, a lot of small clues might not seem important on their own, but together they're as strong as one big piece of evidence. Now, let's talk about the touchiness of the Samaritans. In Luke 9.51, Jesus starts his journey from Galilee to Jerusalem. Luke 9.52-53 shows us that Jesus sent messengers ahead to a town in Samaria. Normally, you'd go through Samaria to get from Galilee to Jerusalem, but the village they stopped at didn't welcome them because Jesus was dead set on heading to Jerusalem. So what gives? Josephus explains that the Samaritans weren't thrilled about Jewish pilgrims from Galilee and other northern areas cutting through their turf on the way to Jerusalem for the feast. A few years later, they even killed a pilgrim, causing a clash with the Galileans and a legal tangle over who was to blame. This tension was partly rooted in the Samaritans worshipping at Mount Gerizim, as we talked about with the woman at the well in John 4.20 in another video. The Samaritans thought that they were worshipping the same God as the Jews, but the Jews said only the real spot to worship Yahweh was in Jerusalem. These regular trips for Jewish feasts highlighted the theological and ethnic differences between the groups. The Jewish pilgrims trekking through Samaritans' land probably weren't the most respectful given their disdain for the Samaritans. So if Jesus was traveling during feast time in Luke 9, the Samaritans probably weren't too thrilled and told his crew to take a hike instead of giving them a place to stay. Now you might be thinking, sure, Luke knew about the beef between the two groups and just made up a tale expecting his readers to fill in the gaps. But hold on because it actually goes even deeper than that. Here's another one. In Luke's gospel, there's a moment when Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem and some Pharisees drop a warning on him that Herod Antipas might be trying to kill him if he doesn't leave the area. But Jesus isn't at all phased by their warning. It probably felt more like a taunt. He's determined to continue his journey to Jerusalem, where he knows he'll eventually face his fate. He even calls Herod a fox and remarks with a touch of bitterness that a prophet can't perish outside of Jerusalem. This passage is part of a long stretch in Luke's gospel that's kind of tricky to pin down chronologically. From Luke 9.51 to about 18.35, it seems like Luke is sharing different stories and sayings from Jesus' life without any clear kind of timeline. In this section, Luke is pulling together accounts from various sources, but he doesn't know exactly when these events happened. He keeps mentioning Jesus being on the road to Jerusalem, but it's not necessarily one continuous journey. The way Luke presents these events shows that he's not trying to give us a strict timeline. He's going for a more thematic or topical approach here, while not changing the facts. But Luke 9.51 does suggest that this verse is marking the start of a journey from Galilee to Jerusalem towards the end of Jesus' life. It seems likely that this is the last time Jesus leaves Galilee before his death, and it could easily align with his trip to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles as mentioned in John chapter 7. This would put it in the fall, about six months before Jesus' death. Now, here's the cool part. The incident in Luke 13, 31 through 35, where the Pharisees give Jesus a dubious warning about Herod, seems to happen outside of Galilee, closer to the end of Jesus' life. This matters because Luke often points out that Herod Antipas was the tetrarch of Galilee. But if Jesus isn't in Galilee during Luke 13, 31, why would the Pharisees be talking about Herod's threat? For the threat to make any kind of sense, wouldn't Jesus need to be in Herod's jurisdiction? But there's a detail about Herod Antipas that Luke doesn't bring up. According to Josephus, Antipas was not only the Tetrarch of Galilee, but he also ruled over the region of Perea, a strip of land east of the Jordan River. All three of the other Gospels mention Jesus spending time east of the Jordan in Perea right before his death, even though they don't use the name specifically. Luke doesn't specify where the Pharisees' warning takes place, 
But given the other Gospels and the fact that Antipas ruled Perea, it all checks out. It's a neat combo of facts that back up Luke's Gospel. Maybe Luke didn't even realize that Antipas was the Tetrarch of Perea in addition to Galilee, since he doesn't mention it. Still, he likely includes the Pharisees' dialogue in 1331 because that's what his sources told him. And since Herod governed the region east of the Jordan River, where the other Gospels say Jesus spent his last weeks, the pieces of the puzzle all come neatly together. From small observations like a sycamore tree in Jericho to the touchiness of the Samaritans, Luke demonstrates that he knows his stuff. It's clear that he's not just borrowing from other Gospels or skimming other written sources, and if he's hearing these stories, the reports he's getting are laser-focused on specifics, not just the broader strokes of the message. I hope you're enjoying this series on how history backs the Bible. Subscribe and stay tuned for more as I continue to discuss the reliability of the Gospels. Thanks for watching.